Hi, so uh, yeah, this is a, a bit like the start of lectures, it takes a little while, so um, you're very welcome uh, to LSE uh, tonight. i have uh, standing in his chair and I've got a, quite a lot of things to, uh, to inform you about, so I have my notes here just in case I forget something. Thankfully, the first note is my name is Professor Liam Delaney, so I feel I'm on solid ground on that one. So uh, I'm Liam Delaney, I'm the head of the Psychology and Behavioural Science Department, uh, and it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome you here tonight to uh, Paul Dolan's launch of uh, the podcast Get Happier. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you both here in the theatre and to the many people from around the world uh, at home. Um, many of you will know Paul, he's Professor of Behavioural Science here at LSE and a former Head of Department uh, at LSE. Uh, he's a very distinguished track record of bringing evidence on well-being and human behaviour uh, into really consequential public policy uh, situations. Uh, for example, he's one of the leading experts on what we call quality-adjusted life years, which, which, which he has, uh, uh, was a leading figure in developing. Uh, he was the lead author on the Mindspace report that brought behavioural science uh, into UK government. And, and more recently, he was one of the brains uh, behind the survey questions that are now used routinely to measure uh, happiness in, in the ONS and across public policy. Paul's also a prolific uh, public engagement, public, uh, prolific career in public engagement on well-being topics, and his two major bestsellers, which are very recommended: Happiness by Design uh, and Happy Ever After. So tonight, Paul will introduce his podcast, Get Happier, which is a series of podcasts which go through uh, a range of ways in which uh, our well-being uh, can be influenced, both individually and, as we'll discuss, uh, societally. In terms of the structure of the event. Paul will talk for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have some Q&A uh, between Paul and I, and then push out to the audience for a Q&A. Um, this is part of the ESRC Festival. It's an incredible event, and I advise you, I'm sure many of you have already looked up at the, uh, at the other uh, uh, events that are going on as part of it. I encourage you to do so. If you're on Twitter, stroke X, stroke Twix, or whatever it's called now, <laughs> It mightn't be great for your well-being, but uh, there is a hashtag, hashtag ESRC Festival. Um, so I think that that is pretty much all I have to say. So it is a great pleasure to, to uh, welcome Paul to the stage. Thank you, Paul. So I just want to sort of manage your expectations downwards. Um, because if you're here, you're probably miserable. So that's actually probably not really <laughs> a good start. Um, let's, see if, let's see if we can get happier. Well, actually, what I'm going to do is obviously say you can get happier by listening to my podcast. That's clearly uh, one thing to do. Um, they were, there's 10 episodes, each of 10 minutes or less. So in the time it takes you to watch a football match, although not the, uh, not the match last night, uh, Tottenham and Chelsea were taking forever, but a normal 90-minute game, um, you can listen to all episodes in one hit. Um, so they're meant to be bite-sized. I, I can't pay attention to things that last very long. Um, and so 10 minutes was about as much as we could record then, wasn't it? Um, with the support of the podcast guys, I don't know. We, we, I should have a slide that gives me my Get Happier list uh, coming up now. Oh, no, do I click? <laughs> I've only worked at the LSE for like ever. Um, there you go. There's a pointer thing and you can click it. Okay, so 10 episodes. I love a checklist. I love a mnemonic. Liam mentioned mind space. Let's make things simple. One of the things actually that academics... Oh, 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 shit. And one of the things that academics who have done lots of talks in public forget to do is to unmute themselves. It's going great, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? It's brilliant. This is seamless. It's like, this is proper professional, this, isn't it? <laughs> this is proper professional. Yes, so what... That's not meant to happen. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't do that either. I didn't do that. That shouldn't, that shouldn't leave. That shouldn't leave the slide. You can listen for free here. Uh, Liam's mentioned all of the sponsors and, and the, you know, sort of the context within which this is uh, set. Um, what I thought I would do is rather than go through the podcast, because you can listen, um, is to, and I should thank Priya, hello, she's here, she's helped me write the script-ish, I mean, I didn't actually listen to anything that she said, I just did it, <laughs> did it anyway, but thank you so much for helping me sort of have a script, um, no, thank you so much. Um, 
rather than rather than go through the episodes, I'd go through the letters of the episodes and try and say something very briefly because I've only got 20 minutes and there's 10 of them, so it's only two minutes each, on maybe some of the policy issues and policy implications that come out of Get Happier rather than making it about individual decision making, uh, think about it in a collective or a public policy setting. Um, and actually worth saying that I'm not sure we actually really know because a lot of the time we are muddling our way through not just trying to get happiness embedded into public policy, but just doing public policy better. Um, and there's lots of lessons to be learned from lots of the things that we, we get right, and especially many of the things that we get wrong. So, I'd, so, so that's the sort of context uh, within which, and I apologize for the online audience. Hello, where are you? Should I be here? Hello, online audience. Bye -bye. I'm gonna get some water. Um, I, I won't be, it's very hard for me to keep still for the, for the online audience. I should thank you for joining online. Um, I mean, not as much as people who actually made the effort to get here, but um, <laughs> for, those of you, for those of you that are online, um, let me go through, and I'll try and keep a bit stiller. Let me, uh, let me, let me uh, go through some of these um, elements. Um, go is clearly the first episode, and it's about getting started. Um, I think one of the things that we, we should become, I mean, actually, a lot of getting happier, and especially in public policies where it's just getting over ourselves about lots of things that are fundamental to the human condition that sometimes we um, don't like about ourselves, maybe the fact that we're lazy, um, and that we form habits. I mean, habits are very quick and efficient, and they're very good guides you know, for us to do things repetitively. Um, and I think policy is a lot like that. You know, if you can predict what we're going to do next year, it's probably much of what, the same as what we did last year. So, so trying to break out of some of those habit loops, um, I think, is a significant thing to do. Um, and insofar as they're bad habit loops, of course, um, and maybe embed some of the behavioural insights that we use for individual decision making into collective decision making. Because fundamentally, policymakers are people as well. I know some of them don't look like it or sound like it, but they are people. Um, and so they'll be subject to, will be subject to, um, all of the same biases that all humans are. So overcoming that, not, not overcoming those, accepting those and getting over ourselves about those effects will be, will be one significant way to get started. Um, in relation to evidence, I mean, for those of you that are familiar with, 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 with any of the evidence, there's broadly... This is putting it very crudely, but very, like two main ways of, evalu of assessing happiness. One is to ask people directly how they're feeling in the moments that they're doing stuff or how ha happy they felt when they were engaged in particular activities over very short periods of time, maybe a day, maybe sometimes using apps. In, that's more experiential-based measures. In contrast to more evaluative-based measures, like asking people questions like, overall, how satisfied are you with your life these days? Right, it's a global, evaluative question. And both are important. Both are useful for policy purposes. Most of the evidence that we have, particularly longitudinal evidence, like that is following the same people over time, comes from asking people questions of an evaluative kind. And I've been much more interested in my own work in the experiential measures, for reasons that we can discuss if you wanted to. Um, <clears throat> but what, what a focus on experiential measures will do for policy is to pay much, much more attention to time use. How we use our time is the scarcest resource of all, right? The time that we've been here is time that we won't ever get back again. You can beg, borrow, and steal money, but you're not going to get time back that's, time that's been lost. And in my experience of, of, of working around different areas of policy is that we pay attention a lot to the big ticket items, sometimes quite rightly, unemployment and you know, so on, house, you know, housing and so on. But actually, maybe where some of the discretion is and the ways in which the policymakers may actually nudge or shove us sometimes into different directions is in relation to how we use our time. So I think a focus on the experiential measures gives us more opportunity to focus on the scarcest resource of all that we have, which is our time. As I say, I'm going to, this is a whistle-stop tour. What I always, always want to do in every talk I ever give is to speak for no more than half of the time allocated because I want to get the discussion going with, with, with you. So let me, I, I will be will be quick, and I'm kind of skating over these issues quickly. Um, maybe where I might spend a bit more time, maybe I won't go through all the elements because there isn't time, but I will we'll spend a few minutes on tales, which is stories, narratives. 
because the, the title right up to publication of Happy Ever After was the, was the narrative trap, and as Penguin know, that's a much better title for the book. For in, in my mind, that was always a much better title for the book, because it is about the narrative trap. It's about the, the, the stories that we get trapped in sometimes that may not be consistent with us being happy, being the authentic versions of ourselves. Um, socially constructed narratives about the lives that we ought to lead, the kind of person that we ought to be, the kind of grown-up that gets married and has kids and has a good job and earns lots of money and is really smart. Um, <clears throat> but we all like a good story. Actually, they're very good at making our lives have some structure, coherence. They give order to a very chaotic world. And policymakers love a good story too. And I kind of get a little bit tired of academics sort of moaning about how policymakers don't listen to the evidence. It's true, policymakers don't listen to the evidence, but we often don't present it in a way that compels them to. Um, it's, it's often very dry, very statistical based, which that's what the evidence is, but it's the narrative around the evidence that will sell. Um, sometimes for good, sometimes for ill. Um, you know, for example, I mean, many of you would have seen some of what we've, what we've said during the COVID pandemic. There is a very powerful narrative around preserving life. Every death is a tragedy, I think, was one of the comments that was made. It's a very powerful, dominant story. To say, alternatively, and in my mind quite rightly, we need to proportionately balance costs and benefits, doesn't have the same gravitas as a story, right? Um, so if we're going to have a competing story, like proportionately balancing costs and benefits, we need a good story around that narration. We need, it, we, we need to narrate that story well, because there's a real dominance and a real moral uh, virtue to making claims like every death is a tragedy, every life, um, saving lives at all costs, right? Very, very powerful, powerful story. So think about the stories that we, that we tell for public policy. Um, hurdles, <coughs> hurdles is around um, some of the psychological biases that lead us in particular directions. Again, to restate the point, policymakers are people. So confirmation bias, optimism bias, these will all be profound in public policymaking, perhaps even magnified uh, in some policy settings. Um, the, main, the main hurdle in relation to proportionately balancing costs and benefits and getting happiness measures of whatever kind into policy is to embed them into the practice of policy. So like we have a Treasury Green Book, some of you will be familiar with it. It's the Bible for economic appraisal in the public sector. Brilliant, brilliant document, fantastically written. It actually contains well-being measures in there now. But how do anyone ever uses it? Like getting, like we can have lots of discussions about how we tweak the green book, but people have got to fucking use it. That's like the main, like that's the first order condition. That's that's you know getting it embedded into into public policy. That's 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 really substantive. That's that's actually one of the biggest hurdles I think. Um, Attention is, is really the glue that holds our life together. Everything that you, that you do and feel is explained by what you pay attention to, consciously and unconsciously allocated. You can only pay attention, it's a very good term, pay attention, it means it comes at a price. When you pay attention to one thing, you can't pay attention to something else. Policymakers can't either. Policymakers are very, very um, susceptible to situational blindness. It's where, it's basically tunnel vision where you're paying attention to something because it's important because you're paying attention to it. Again, the COVID illustration, I don't want to draw too much you know, back to that, but hospitalizations, deaths, hospitalizations and deaths, literally, that was the focus of attention throughout, which draws our attention away from other substantively important considerations. And it's why checklists are so powerful. Um, You'll be familiar with the fact that checklists work very well in the aviation industry, in hospital surgery, uh, in um, operating theatres, because the checklists are really simple. You know, planes would previously take off without co-pilots, because the pilots had checked all the instrumentation was working and forget to check they've got a co-pilot sitting next to them. So these checklists are really obvious, 
but they draw attention to things that are overlooked. A lot of what we do, and in, in everything about happiness, behaviour, policy, whatever else, is obvious but overlooked. It's obvious but overlooked. And checklists enable us to pay attention to the things that substantively matter, not just to the things that we're paying attention to in that narrow focus at the moment in time. So, that's the tension. Pleasure and purpose, uh, uh, well, obviously, um, I've written a book about that. For, pub for public policy purposes, um, and Danny Kahneman has influenced me, I think, heavily on this uh, uh, point, is um, uh, we're actually better off using misery and suffering as language for policy. Because you can sort of take the piss out of happiness for policy, and it's a little bit flaky and subjective, and who wants smiley faces or whatever. But like, if you, if you said that you were not actively seeking to reduce misery and suffering by as much as possible, that'd make you sound a bit sadistic. Right? So even though we might use the same metrics, even, why, even, even though we might use the same appraisal techniques, doing so in the, la the, the language of misery, I think, is, is, is significant and, and probably gets us further in embedding it into policy. Uh, talking of misery, at the population level, as we all know, misery is much more contagious than happiness. Um, and so being alert to community uh, levels of well-being is really significant. Um, and talking of communities, we are trying to build a community at, of, uh, well, uh, basically a happy campus, I guess, I guess you might want to call it that, at the Engineerium in Hove. Um, Luke Johnson and I uh, have come together to, to do that, to build happy communities. That's the kind of strap line of the, of the work that we're, that we're doing and planning to do there, which is to bring people together that might not otherwise meet. That's part of what we're planning to do. Um, talk across the political divide, the intergenerational divide. I mean, that, you know, very, very, that's probably one area where we have least contact with other people, right? Grandparents will probably only know young people through their grandkids and vice versa. Um, there's, very, there's much less intergenerational contact than maybe there are in other parts of the world. Can we, can we think of interventions that would help bring people together to uh, improve well-being? And that leads into the interventions. One of the things that I just wanted to say about that is the big, probably the biggest thing is to accept that not everything works and that sometimes we're going to make mistakes and get things wrong. And I think we just need a grown-up conversation about that, particularly in public policy. Like a test and learn approach. Stop doing things that don't work. That's like, but, be, but, but have an environment that allows us to make mistakes. I think that's why probably actually one of the biggest hurdles to get in anything done properly in public policy, it doesn't have to be about happiness at all, is um, a kind of lessons learned culture as opposed to mistakes and money wasted. Sometimes money is wasted, but you can often learn lessons. You'll know personally from your own experiences of life that the things that you've learned most from are not the things you did well, but the things you fucked up. So that's, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a, a sort of feedback that I think is really important for policy. Two more to go, and then I'm done, and I'm pretty much on time. Um, uh, one is employment. Um, I probably needed two E's. That's probably why it's employment. No. The, the actually, of course, we spend a significant amount of our time at work. Actually, we spend an even more, more amount of time thinking about work, right? I mean, Sunday evenings is one of, the, one of the least happy times for people in the week because they're thinking about Monday morning. Uh, I, I can see a few heads nodding. That's uh, Sunday, 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 Sunday evening effect. Um, and... This is, where, this is where it's really important. I think I distinguished before between evaluation and experience. This is where it's important to distinguish between pleasure and purpose, I think, right? So, you know, m most people don't go to work for fun. Certainly not at the LSE. Um, <laughs> but they go to work because it feels like it's worth it in some sense. It has a point. There's actually nothing worse than doing a job that you feel is wasting your time. That's actually really significantly the most detrimental effect on your well-being at work. So doing things, having jobs that, 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 that feel like they have a point. Um, you know, I've made, I've made comments variously in the past about florists being happier than bankers and lawyers. It's not to suggest that everyone becomes a florist, although probably it would be a better place if there were fewer bankers and lawyers. But, um, but there, are, there are attributes of the job in floristry and hairdressing that lend themselves to being happier direct feedback of what you're doing, feed, feedback on what you're doing from people who generally enjoy the fact that they've had the interaction with you, 
seeing the fruits of your labour and so on. So thinking about how we can make banking and lawyer, lawyer, lawyering <laughs> more like floristry and hairdressing, right? Are there ways in which you can embed feedback? Because feedback is absolutely critical. That's, that's, that's the key bit. Timely and salient feedback is the, is the thing that matters most at work. Then finally, reflection. This is, uh, I'll take a breath after, after this. Um, One of the ways in which we reflect on stuff is through conversation. Again, it comes back to narratives and stories. <clears throat> I don't think we don't have a huge amount of time in policy to embed conversations from which lessons can be learned about what we should do differently, or maybe the same next time. And I think doing that, again, across the political divide, with people coming to challenges and problems with a good intent. I think sometimes, particularly, it's, like, it's very timely at the moment, so often we think that that political difference is, is kind of motivated out of the other side, the out-group, you know, being, being nasty and horrible and evil. Well, sometimes they are, but most, most of the times they're not. Most of the times we have a lot in common about the goals that we want to achieve. And so being able to talk to one another with respect and to disagree respectfully, and to listen to people that we disagree with. That's a, a theme of my next book. I have my editor sitting in front of me for my next book. Um, working title, Taking Sides, title yet to be determined, and George Melios, who's working with me on, on it, is here somewhere. Um, I'm really interested in, in, in how we can learn to listen better to people that disagree with us. Um, it's cut, partly, I think, what drew me into academia, at least that's a retrospective uh, story that I, that I tell. Um, interesting in its relation to happiness, because of course sometimes living in our bubbles kind of makes us feel good, and it's easier to just to think that the world is all like the people that we surround ourselves with. But stepping outside of those bubbles can maybe potentially make us happier, but it's certainly better for society. So on that note, on that rather optimistic note, um, I will wrap up. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> Um, okay, everyone. So uh, for those online, if, uh, if you've got a question, just uh, type it into the Q&A function. Um, ideally, give your name and affiliation and let us know if you're uh, an LSE student or alumni. Uh, keep the questions short, if you, if you could, just to give more time. And uh, similarly to the audience, if you just uh, raise your hand when you have questions, we'll do, we'll do a couple of rounds and uh, I'll go over to Rose. I think I, I, I'm being asked to start with some questions, Paul. So... Um, I, I think the, the one that comes to mind, so, I mean, I, I like that you said it, you know, it's not a fundamentally a self-help um, podcast and that there's quite a few, and I mean, that's not to say there's anything bad with self-help, there's some quite good podcasts around how people can improve their individual happiness, but I think what I've always liked about your work, you've always had this sense which it clashes off all sorts of institutions in really interesting ways, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on how you see the sort of interplay between individual things and community level things that people can do to improve their well-being and then big things like you know, climate change, corporate control, <coughs> social media, those sort of things. Like where, where do you see this sort of community you're building within that sort of individual societal uh, level? Yeah, Maybe you shouldn't ask question the question. I know I was going to say, you, <laughs> I think you should have phoned it over to the audience. That's a tough one. Um, so first of all, just to say something very quickly about self-help. Uh, self-help doesn't work because that's why it's so successful. Because like, the reason you buy another self-help book was because the last one didn't work, right? So, so having bought a self-help book is the single biggest factor predicting buying a self-help book. So, um, and they give you this, and they kind of give you this, and that's fact, and they give you this glib advice, like, be positive. It's like, yeah, no shit, I worked that out, but how do I actually do it? So it's kind of embedding the obvious but overlooked into your daily, daily experiences. And at the individual level, there are some, like, you know, whilst it's not self-help and there's no one-size-fits-all approach to happiness. There are some things that I can be pretty damn confident would make all of you happy if you did more of them every day. You know, if you listen to music, spent more time with people you like being with, went outdoors, had a new experience, helped other people. You know, any one or more of those things every day, a little bit of those things every more every day, at the individual level, I'll come to the policy minute, would, would make us all happier. So why aren't we doing it? Well, it's obvious, but I've looked. We're not embedding it into our daily lives. The question then becomes is, well, insofar as those things are good for us, is there a role for government and policy in nudging or shoving us in the direction of doing those things? And sometimes they feel like they're a bit personal, like, you know, the government, like, like making me listen to music or something would be a bit odd. But 
being able to design the architecture in ways that make it easier for people to find the time to do those things seemed to be a legitimate um, use of public resources and government intervention alongside some of the big ticket stuff as I was talking about earlier, like unemployment, housing and so on. Then to the collective action problem, it does remind me a bit of the discussion in behavioural science about, you know, when you're doing all these little nudges, are you, are, you taking direct, are you taking attention away from the really big systemic challenges that we face, you know, climate change and stuff, whatever else? Um, and there is, because attention is scarce, there is the potential for that. I don't, I mean, I wouldn't deny, I wouldn't deny that. There's, you know, we've only got limited attention as well as time. Um, but I'd like to think that there's, more, that there's less tension. It's a bit like talking across the political divide. Less, less tension than is made out in uh, some of the discourse. Um, and that we can have discussions about some of the structural stuff. Because, like, you know, our, uh, it's true that poverty, like, poverty makes people miserable. So it's really important that that, that, is, that is made clear. Because a lot of academics, like, glibly say money doesn't make you happy. They've probably got enough to the point at which they are happy with it. Um, but... Beyond the point when you're constantly, constantly searching and searching and searching, reaching for more and more and more, there comes a point at which you're giving up the music and going outdoors and spending time with friends and helping other people to get more and more and more. So absolutely, as a, as a, as a kind of collective action problem, we could think of ways in which we might rein ourselves in. Because we're not going to do it individually. You can't really, it's hard to swim, swim against the tide as an individual. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that, we, we could do better. And I, I feel like I kind of, like sort of, we haven't sort of fouled a little bit with this, is to create a movement that gets people banging on the doors of policymakers to say, like, why aren't you doing more to improve happiness? Because we can galvanise people to do other things. We haven't, we haven't quite yet managed to galvanise people to do that, or to actually to reduce misery more. I guess that's probably the better point. Great, so why don't we uh, kick into the audience? So I'll take maybe three questions at a time, and Rose, then you, you, you'll take some uh, from the Q&A. So yeah, you can keep them relatively short so we can get in a good few rounds. So we'll start with yourself. Super quick context. I, I do a lot of activism, which is about trying to make something better for everyone. But in the doing of it, I feel like it takes away some opportunities to do those small individual things, because it's time consuming. It means I work less, so I've got less money. I can't go out with my friends and do fun things on the weekend because I'm always protesting. And I wondered if, like, you've, uh, like, what to do about that? Because, like, <laughs> I, I've sort of tried, like, I feel like there is a way to collectively help, but sometimes it steals from your self okayness. Let's yeah. take a couple at a time. Great, great question. Yeah, yourself in the white shirt in the front row. If you could give your name, maybe, as well. Uh, hi, I'm Jim. Uh, this is Alice. Um, Paul, Sorry, you where, spoke. Where are you, Jim? Sorry. Oh, oh, I'll make Paul, you spoke a bit about attention and time being the ultimate sort of currency yeah. that we can't get back. Uh, and you spoke about the Sunday night fear thing. Um, why do people find it so difficult to live in the moment? Because on a Sunday night, you shouldn't necessarily fear being at work because you're not at work yet. Mm -hmm. Yet people fear the things that are about to happen and then relive, constantly relive things that have already yes. happened. Yes. Um, so, so why is that? And, and what can we do to... And stop doing that. Thank you. We'll just take one more question. Yeah, just in the corner there, just, yeah, in the pink wine jumper. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Teresa. I was just wondering, you mentioned that policy should design an architecture that could help us or nudge us towards more happiness uh, or in the right direction. Could you maybe give a specific example or any specific policy you have in mind um, of how this could look like? Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Great, Paul. That's three. I think that should be enough. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> I have no idea what you should do. Right. That's the. That's the first. <laughs> but I can. But I can give you the pleasure purpose principle to work that out. Right. So, I I contend that that, ha that happy lives are ones that find the right balance between things they find fun and fulfilling. And that's not the same, it's not equal, it's not the same for everybody. Some people are more pleasure machines, others are more purpose engines. But if you're being drawn too much towards one, you probably could be happier overall if you shifted a little bit of your time and attention towards the other. Um, and it's about, and I do think sometimes that's a natural, it's a sort of natural process as li through life as well, right? It's never static at any one moment in time. You know, kids will have a very different balance to people that are older and, you know, so on. So I think it's kind of working out. And sometimes the only way we work out where 
the balance is, is by going too far in one direction. Because we can naturally become kind of addicted to one kind of happiness or one kind of experience. And then sort of being alert. So, so once in a while doing an audit, it's not like a formal thing, but you know, like, an, like a sort of little, what you've, what you've just done is actually probably enough as a start. Um, thank you. No, no, thank you. Um, there's an interesting question about what actually living in the, mo like the moment is, even, right? Because the moment, it, the moment has just got, like, it's, got, it's just gone. The moment I've just, like, paid attention to the moment, the moment's not, not there anymore. So there's never, we're never actually ever in, like, like from, a, from a, we're never actually ever in a moment. Um, there's, only ever, there's only ever really something, even in the moment, that's an anticipation or a memory in some sense. And I'm kind of trying to work some of that through conceptually. We've been, we've been trying to think about how we capture the impact of events like this, right? So you think about this event of living in the moment. This has been a fantastic hour. You couldn't have otherwise used your time better. <laughs> but it's still only an hour. So no matter how good it is, it's only an hour. But you've had all the looking forward to it, which I'm sure has been in your diary for weeks, and you're counting down the, the, the minutes. And then you've got the memory of it and the conversations that you'll have about it afterwards. So sometimes those anticipations and memories are actually really good things. Actually, what you want to do is cultivate them more, right? We want more of the anticipation and more of the memory. So the kind of living in the... They sort of people say, live in the moment. I kind of, first of all, what is it? That's a, that's a, tr a tricky question. But then, then like, um, secondly, it's, it, it, it actually is good for us sometimes to be living in anticipations and living in memories and, and, and as I say all the kind of n narration of conversations is about is about memory um, but generally I mean there is good evidence on meditation and mindfulness as many people will 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 know and you don't have to do that formally um, I've, I've always maintained that my time in the gym is essentially mindfulness for me because I don't pay attention to very much else while I'm in the gym um, the thought of sitting down and doing meditation or mindfulness, I'd, I'd rather kill myself. Um, uh, but that, so, and there's a really good example of the heterogeneity that there is across people. I never, it's all that prescription. But absolutely, meditation and, and mindfulness is brilliant for the people that select into it and it works for. I have absolutely no issue with that at all, because it, it works. But there are other ways in which we can find to live in the moment that doesn't have to be mindfulness and meditation that makes you just pay attention to what it is that you're doing. Um, no no um, simple answer to a, to a tricky question. And then the last question was about pol happiness policy. Yeah, it's a question, it's, a, it's a much a question for you as really as anyone else. It's like, if, if we know that these are, there are these big ticket experiences that are good for us, is it a legitimate role for government to be nudging us or shoving us to do more of them or less of the things that make us bad. Um, I think actually, if you think about one of the, the, actually probably the biggest ticket determinant of well-being. Uh, let me take a step back. When I ask questions in audiences, you know, public events, or whatever, where there's time, like, what do you think the big determinants of happiness are? People come up with the unemployment, income, marriage. Hardly anybody says sleep. Like, but you all know, you know, we all know, it's the biggest determinant of, of, of how we feel. And it has huge effects on our, on our health, on, on our life expectancy even. If you only cared about that, if you cared about qualities, you'd, you'd, you'd really care about sleep. So I do think there's, a, there's a, some legitimacy in government nudging us to do things in ways that would help us sleep better. And then once we get in there, well, are there other areas? So I think it's, just, it's as much a conversation about where the legitimate boundaries of the state are uh, as anything else. OK, let's uh, take three more. Um, God, uh, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'll, I'll make a start with uh, just the person in the white top to start with. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Nurlaim. I'm LSE student. You've mentioned uh, policy language as misery and suffering. Mm. So my question is, can there be a fear of happiness in the policy level and maybe individual level? A fear of happiness. And uh, I'll, let me just, yeah, OK, this gentleman here and then yourself in the back top. Hello. Uh, you mentioned experience sampling as an alternative mm. to the evaluative. I would be curious of examples of how this can help policy, especially mm. considering what you mentioned about like, not just being in the moment, but evaluating uh, more memorable moments. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Hi, Paul. Thank you for your talk. I'm Ingrid. I study behavioral science. Uh, my question would be, uh, do you believe in a concept of hedonic treadmill, and how can policy take it into consideration? Uh, furthermore, how can it impact policy targeted at improving well-being? Okay, thank you. Um, I have to admit I'm not clear on the fear of happiness uh, question. Um, uh, it's like you mentioned the policy language as misery, yes. suffering. So if there will be like the society will be happy, the individuals will be happy, will there be a place for the policy makers in general? If everyone's happy? Oh, I see. Because they won't. Because they're because they'll kind of do, uh, do their work out so that they're, they're no longer needed. Yeah. Wow, we're a long way away from that. <laughs> I think we're probably safe in all of our lifetimes, let alone mine, which is a lot shorter than m m many of you. Um, that we'll still have the problem of being happier with policy. Um, uh, experience sampling, I, I think one of the things, it depends what, like the ways in which information could be used by policymakers. So I think it'd be really interesting to, to know when, like some of the LSE students here are going to go off into the outside world, they'll be coming to talk to Liam and me, well mostly Liam because I don't really know what to tell them, um, <laughs> about, about what sorts of careers they should have, what sort of jobs they should take. Um, it'd be great to have data on just what it's like to do a day's work in that job, <laughs> or a week's work, or a year's work, or whatever, with the experience, just as information. I'd like to know, it'd be really interested to know whether people would actually take any of that information seriously. Because I think one of the challenges, one, one, of, the, one of the many challenges with this is that, is that we, think of, we really think ourselves as special. Right? Oh, well, that might apply to other people, but, but, but not to me. And then, of course, you go and have the experience, and it's exactly the same as it was uh, for them. So I think that's, that's, that's one area, like the time use stuff could be really, really useful was just by way of information. Um, um, I was going to, sorry, Liam, were you going to say? Well, I was just thinking, related to the first question about whether there's an incentive sometimes not to make people happier. I was just thinking <laughs> yeah. of the LSE students in the room. So you've come to LSE, all of the effort and so on, and at the end of the evening, we're going to tell you, well, you know what, you'd have been happier uh, being a florist <laughs> or, <laughs> or have you taken hairdressing so I do think there is definitely I mean I think well, like, uh, there's an interesting question that there's points at which you, you know you e maybe e do e have an incentive if you're a policymaker sometimes to get people to work harder pay more tax do all this stuff as opposed to find things that make them happier well you might be suggesting that's what they do I did say that it would, we could make lawyers and bankers have experiences at work that were more like floristry and uh, hairdressing um, but I mean, look, I think it's actually, I mean, it's, worth, it's worth people knowing some of the associations between different levels of education and happiness in work. I mean, that seems to be, it would say, you, you, know what the income, you know what the income effects will be. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that seems to be really important. Interestingly, when I wrote Happiness by Design, I'm going to be a little bit personal, personal story now, that, was like, that came out in 2014. My kids were like five, four, five six years old, uh, 2013, yeah, four, four or five, and... I said I'd be happier if they were builders rather than bankers. And people said to me, oh, you know, just wait till they get older. That, that'll, that'll all change. They're now teenagers. My daughter's doing her GCSEs next year. My son's in year 10. And I'm like, I, I, I'm having conversations with them about what they might do next and what jobs are going to make them happy. Like, it isn't about, mm. it may not be about coming to the LSC and doing a master's or a PhD. <laughs> but it might be. But it might be. Actually, my daughter said, why would I want to go anywhere near where you are? Which I, thought, which I thought was actually a very healthy, healthy response from a teenager. But um, uh, it, it will be, there will be, there, there will be, I mean, the point is, the point comes back to the one, the, the one size fits all thing. There, there, there isn't a one size fits all approach. Doing a, doing a master's or a PhD or whatever, LSE will be brilliant for some people, um, but it won't be for others. And we should have a narrative, we shouldn't have a narrative that says it's good for everybody that comes and does it. I think that's, that would be my point. Uh, I've got a hedonic treadmill question to oh, answer. Yeah, of course, yeah. um, Yes, um, and so one of the things that we need to be alert to is the things that don't that we don't adapt to over time, um, and you know those experiences those experiences are largely non-adaptive. I mean, there's some degree of adaptation, but you know, spending time with people you like being with doesn't get any less good, and actually, friendships cultivate over time. So there can be sensitisation to some of those things. 
Um, listening to music, I mean, I still listen to some of the tunes that I've always... I mean, they, they, they doesn't, I don't feel like I'm having any less pleasure listening to that uh, music. Uh, on the negative side, which is really important, I want to make this... This is an op opportunity to make this important point, is that we know that there are significant mental health conditions that people don't adapt to. You don't get used to being depressed. You don't get used to attention-seeking conditions like schizophrenia and so on. It makes them all the more important that policymakers prioritise them. Stuff that we get used to, yeah, it's bad. It's, you know, we, wanna not, you know, we wouldn't want people to, ex to experience those things. But compared to things where there's increased sensitisation in the negative domain, that's where policy should prioritise. Uh, Rose, you're going to take some questions from the <coughs> online audience and then we'll come back for a couple of rounds in, the, in person. <coughs> Great, so I'll give three from the online audience, if that's okay. So the first one is an anonymous one. It's, do you think that involving yourself with happy people will in a way turn you happy, in a sense that you can adapt to their habits and engage in their environment or activities? So that's the first one. Second one is from LSE alum Jessica Feldman. And the question is, how can one get rid of the social pressures and expectations when one compares oneself to friends, relatives, others belonging to the same social class, and not feel like a failure when one's own life is not a success story. And finally, the third question is also from an alum, Max Rank. And the question is, what's the number one thing that increases subjective well-being on average, which surprised you, with particular reference to policymakers? Super questions, super questions. I love the online audience. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the first thing is that, that, that yes, I mean, Emotions are contagious. I mean, look, everything is contagious. We're social creatures. We're wired to be around other people. We take cues for our behaviour and our feelings from those around us. So if you're miserable, surround yourself with happy people. It's just the happy people might not want you around them. So that's the, <laughs> that's the challenge. Pretend, pretend that you're happy. Get in there. <laughs> this is good advice, isn't it? This is good advice. That anonymous person is getting some serious help. Um, <laughs> pretend you're happy. Get yourself around happy people, and then you'll be happier. Um, don't bring them down with your misery. Um, the social comparisons is, what, is, is, is really interesting. We, again, social creatures compare themselves to others. You know, if you ask me, like, am I, am I happy with my income or whatever, I just have to make a comparison. I can't, I don't, I don't, that absolute figure doesn't mean anything. It has to have context. It has to have comparison. I can make myself feel more or less happy by the kinds of comparisons I make. Sadly, most of the comparisons we make, for happiness purposes anyway, are upward. Um, but there was, again, to go back to Liam, Liam's point about you know, encouraging people for taxes and, so, and, and other things, is that there will be advantage in that. You know, if you signal status and, and, and high achievement, it makes people more likely to be driven to it in ways that might be socially advantageous. So there's never a straightforward answer to these questions. I think that what we can do is accept the fact that we compare ourselves. I think, I think that, you know, it's the people who say, people who say things like, I don't care what people think. You know that that person really cares what people think. Or people say, I don't compare myself to other people. You can't, of course you do. You're a human being, right? So, again, get over ourselves, accept that, and then maybe we can, maybe we can design environments that make the comparisons different or better. You know, comparisons with the most pro-social person, the happiest person, the funniest person, the most helpful person. Um, rather than the, uh, the, one, the one who earns the most. It's an interesting one if you look online, you know, world's richest ma man, it's nearly always man. Um, uh, it, it, you know, you get that answer very quickly. Highest taxpayer, you find tax evasion schemes uh, 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 where you can, you know, snaffle your money away so you don't pay tax. So, you know, we can, given that we make the social comparisons, we can make transparent things that would be better for us in some sense, maybe. Um, and then, did I have a third question? What was that? This more surprising. Oh, surprising, yes, that was... Nothing surprising once you find it out. Um, one thing that I did do... Let me, well, let me just talk about a recent paper, the most recent paper we have published, I think. Um, some of you may have seen this. It's uh, All We Want Is A Healthy Baby, well, and one of the opposite sex to the two that we have already. Um, was that I, I saw... A lot of our research is informed by introspection and just, like, observation, and I saw a family on the tube a long time ago, it took a long time to get this work done and published, um, who had five boys. And I, five boys. And I thought, poor sods. Like, kids three, four, and five were meant to be a girl. 
right? And people will say, no, all we want is a healthy baby, but everyone knows. Everyone knows that by the time you're at five, you're praying for the opposite sex. So, so what we did is we take, we take data from the, from the British Cultural Studies and uh, the NCDS data, and we, and, we, and we look at mothers and fathers, separate, they're not household, who have two children of the same sex. And then we look at whether you win the lottery by getting the opposite sex, or you lose the lottery by getting the same sex. I expected, in answer to this question, I expected to find that all four groups that lost the lottery, so the, so the mothers who had, then had three girls, mothers who had three boys, fathers who had three girls, fathers who had three boys, all four groups would be less happy than the ones that won the lottery. Turns out not to be the case at all. We've got lots of data on many people over many years, so this is quite a robust finding insofar as you can say anything meaningful from it. Turns out that the only group that's miserable, and they're really fucking miserable, by the way, like 10 years' worth of misery, like a decade's worth of misery, and it's about, like, I don't know, half the effect of, of unemployment or thereabouts, I think it's big, um, are mothers that have three daughters. Um, <clears throat> so, if you are the third child, or if you are the mother with three daughters, you can certainly work out how to get happier. Um, so that was an interesting and surprising finding. Um, so we can go to the audience for three questions. Hands down, if that's just an objection to the three daughters. Uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah, yeah, yourself in the sort of black blazer. Yeah. <clears throat> there are always exceptions to every rule, of course. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Nora. I'm not a student here, but I do come here to learn from people that I normally wouldn't. Uh, so that's my kind of intervention. Uh, back to the individual. Uh, when you talked about yeah. pleasure and purpose, you also mentioned that feedback is critical. Yes. Now, what do we do in those situations where you either like apply for a job, you don't get even an interview, therefore you don't have feedback about it, or you apply to a program, you're yeah. discouraged to actually ask for feedback even, and when you do, you don't really get any. Yeah. What do you do in those cases when you feel like you know, that's your purpose? Do you shift your attention and let that go? Do you keep sacrificing short-term pleasure for that long-term purpose? Great, and again, the lady in the white, uh, yeah, the white jumper there, and then the gentleman in the black top, and then I'll come over to that side for the next round. Um, hi, my name's Opa, I'm in year 12. Um, you know that uh, florist and lawyer thing that you mentioned, like, I don't know, 15 minutes ago? Um, you know how florists and, like, people who work in hairdressing have that sort of love for interpersonal relationships? and they find such a natural love for what they do, whereas in comparison to lawyers and bankers who kind of, um, I don't know, if, if I say it really bluntly, um, they're kind of miserable. How do they find that same sort of like artistic passion and like love for what they do? Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And then yeah, the gentleman just in the black uh, top, just a couple of rows up. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm Jerry, and I wonder what is your opinion on the possibility long, of achieving long-term happiness through drugs? Okay. <laughs> so it's great when you know these things are being recorded. Um, <laughs> they're going online for a really long why, why time. Why do I get the feeling I'm going to spend all tomorrow? Handling complaints. To the <laughs> <laughs> Always ask for forgiveness, Liam, not for permission. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let me deal with let me deal with these while my unconscious mind processes that third question. Um, the feedback, um, yes. So obviously, just to be clear, students at LSE shouldn't ask me for any more feedback on their work because that's really time-consuming and I hate it. So, that, so, there, are, so there clearly are contexts within which you, know, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't get more feedback. The most annoying thing is students can I have more feedback. Um, but uh, most of the time, most of the people just ask Liam, he'll, he'll give you loads of it. Um, I just wanted to, to just say, so yes, so it, it is important for us to kind of get, get, get that feedback and actually get feedback for us. For, 
for ourselves from the kinds of audits that we were talking about before, about the things that make us feel good or bad, because we're just creatures of habit. So much of what we do, we're just doing it. We're like, hold on a minute, I don't know why I'm doing this. This actually isn't making me very happy. And I wanted to just this thing, like, be, just pick up on that long-term, short-term thing, because I think when, ple- when purpose is added into the uh, sentiments of experience alongside pleasure, there shouldn't really be any long-term and short-term trade-off. Because if something doesn't feel pleasurable nor purposeful for very long, stop doing it. Stop doing it. Like, the promise of happiness down the road is a big risk. Like, it's not like investing money where you can get more back later. You're not going to get more happiness back later because you've given up loads of it to get there. And actually, it probably won't make you happy when you get there anyway. So I would be really, I just, like, there's a really, I think, important point about just not getting sucked into continuing to do things because that's kind of what's expected or because you've got some habit for doing it. Step away and do something else. Um, There's a good question about, there's a real, there is clearly selection effects and I was trying, like, it's partly, you know, what we'd love to do is have randomised controlled trials where we allocate people to floristry, to hairdressing, to banking and lawyering, right? And then I could look at the treatment effects of those jobs. We don't have that. We have selection effects. We have different types of people, which is what you've drawn attention to, going into the different jobs. What we want to know is what the counterfactual would be for that person. And it's absolutely true that people will select on the basis of, you know, how much they like being around other people and uh, so on. So, having said all of that, most of us, even introverts, like being around other people. They just don't like spending all their time around other people and they need time away to recharge. And that's essentially what makes an extrovert and an introvert different is the time away to kind of be on their own, to get energy back, as it were. Extroverts need much less of that than introverts. So, so interpersonal, and anybody who's worked or in any environment, even with your you know, faculty and students or your teachers or whatever, is you know that the biggest attention-seeking bits of the work are actually good and bad relationships. So kind of encouraging, this is something for management actually, I think, as well, is to kind of learn how to manage in ways that don't make every interaction with employees stressful. Because actually, if you look at some of the, some of the experience sampling or the day reconstruction method data, the most miserable time that people have is with their boss, which is a pretty sad indictment of Liam. Um, <laughs> so, right, on... I uh, don't think there was a third question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, time's up. <laughs> Let's all go and do some... No, um, so there's really interesting... This, is, this, is, this enables me to... I've, I've now had time for, to filter what I was going to say. Um, to, give a, to give a response that can go on the recording. Um, that there's very good evidence around psychedelics, um, psilocybin and so on, that I think that if we could only get over the moral judgments that come, well, wherever they come from, then we would be more actively engaging in the use of drugs of that kind in particular. And it's a really interesting question where we get the morality of things being good and bad from. Like, if something works and it's good and it makes people better off and everything, nothing's free, there's always going to be costs and benefits to everything. There's, no, there's no, nothing that doesn't have a downside. But if the downsides are worth it for the individuals and society, I think we have a moral... Uh, the, the, the morality should suggest that these are things we should be doing. But so many people have an aversion. It's a system one reaction in the language of kind of dual processing models. We have an effective reaction that something is wrong. Be it's been ingrained in us, you know, through millennia. And then we look for system two validation and justification for why it's wrong. But when those system two justifications and validations go away, we should revise our views. And I I think that's true in relation to some drugs. It's true in relation to, um, to maybe other, other interventions that may not be drug-related. I think there's also a morality around effort. Like somehow taking drugs that work is somehow lazy and easy. And being happy shouldn't be lazy and easy. Like, the f- who? like I, don't understa- I don't understand that. Log- I don't understand that. If you give me something that's effortless, Crack on. 
Folks, we'll take one uh, final round. So, uh, yeah, I didn't really make it over to that side. So the gentleman in the, I, I, do they call it a puffer jacket, I think? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Liam's trying to label clothing tonight. This is what, <laughs> wine-coloured jumper, puffer jacket. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Sarthak. I'm a master's student in behavioural science at LSC. So I just wanted to ask, in your opinion, on an average, are people happier in their past memories or in their future expectations? I love that question. And I, then just the lady oh, sorry, no, as well, and then we that. take some for the online. And then I'm afraid, yeah. sorry folks, we'll have to stop it there then after that. So, yep. Uh, thank you. I'm Dina. I'm a consumer researcher and academic. So my question is an extension of Professor Liam's question about what individual actions can we take to mitigate the negative impact and the feeling of helplessness that we experience when we witness neg extreme negative events like a genocide and the death of children, when even collective action does not actually result in any change. Paul, are you okay just for the final round? We just take a couple of questions also from the online and then... I, I'm, absolutely, much, I'm absolutely made up for that. Um, so two policy related ones from the online audience. How so many? Two or three? I've two? got two. Okay. I've got two. How many are you doing? Two? Two. Two. Okay. I have to remember what, I make notes, I can't read what I write. So what, was the, what was the first, I've, I've lost, I've completely lost track of what the questions were. What was the first question from here? Memories, memories, yeah, memories or anticipations, thank you. And the and second one was helplessness. That one I did remember more so, yeah, so memories okay. and anticipations. And then from the online audience, so the first one is from Kate Lathan. Um, sure. Could you say something about how we can use wellbeing metrics to understand the impacts of interventions that show up predominantly in people's experience in the medium or the long term is it realistic to think that we can capture that? That's one question. And the second one is uh, an anonymous one. Does the four-day week actually improve happiness? Why are the majority of businesses so averse to the idea? Oh, super, super questions. Uh, are we done? Yeah, done. Uh, what, now? Oh, you've got, you've I've got, got to answer them. Oh, that's right. your last goal, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, okay, so... Make it count. Yeah, make it count. Yeah, exactly. Um, I feel like I should know the answer to that question. No, but I, I, feel, like, I feel like I ought to, because I, I, I think there should be data that would be able to tell us that. I do think that there will be huge individual variation in, in it. To make a prescription about what, which is worse is, will, be, will be difficult. Some people worry, and some people ruminate. Um, and there's, I don't think we've got very many, we, we have some general population data that might be able to speak to that. I don't think we've analysed it with that question in mind. So let me come back to you with an answer to that question when I can articulate it better. Help, I don't know, is the answer to your question. Again, I'm like, there has to be some things that we just say we don't know. I just, I don't know. Like, I mean, you want to be, no, you want to know what's going on in the world. You want to be aware, aware you want to be, um, you know, uh, uh, informed. But at the same time, it can, it can make you really fucking miserable. And, and I don't know. So it's, individuals have to, have to work out for themselves how to balance that. I don't know. I do think something worth saying about people that engage in activism and you know, protest and stuff is that they're often angry, you know, rightly, rightly so, at in, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the injustice in the world. But they're actually really optimistic because like, they're actually going out on the streets in the rain and they're doing something. So, so, there, is a, so there is an optimism in that anger. And that's quite, that's quite kind of, you know, galvanising, I think, in, in uh, some ways. But sometimes it can feel, it just can feel helpless. Um, Kate's question wasn't quite as awkward as I imagined Kate being. Um, the medium and long term, I mean, I, w w in the long run, we're all dead. That's what Kane said, right? That's, uh, so everything is really the short run, really. Um, and I think that one thing that I think we know from behavioural science is that you need to make whatever it is that people are doing feel like they're worth doing in the moment. Or moments, insofar as moments exist, right? So, you know, you're not gonna get, well, you can, but you, it's much harder to get people to engage in climate activity or health activity, and Kate knows all of this, um, if you're focusing on the medium and long-term. We are contemporaneous creatures. We live and experience now. We imagine the future, but most of the time, sometimes it's you know the next few weeks. But not, not, not most of the time. Most of the time, it's not twenty or thirty years time. Most of the time, it's not a lifetime away. So making things feel like they're worth it, pleasure and purpose in in the daily experiences, is the way to galvanise change for the longer and medium for the medium and longer term. 
And then the final question was... Four day a week. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. There's a huge selection effect in that. I don't know whether... I don't know whether there's slack in the efficiency of the companies for which that's worked most in. Um, I don't know whether... And I also think there's a, like, it's a bit re reminiscent of the COVID thing. I know this, and this is with the greatest respect to the questioner because I'm not suggesting this, but is, the, is a kind of imagination that everybody has sort of like office-type jobs that uh, we can all do four days. Like if you're a bus driver or an Uber driver or whatever, you're like, you, like, you, you, you get paid for the hours you work. Um, and you can't do them, you know, unless, you like, unless they change the rates. You can't, do, you can't do the work in fewer hours. And I, I wonder, I don't think we pay enough attention to those, to those jobs. Um, and enough attention, this is a nice place for me to finish, to some of those class differences that are really prominent and significant that we can get lost in, all of us, include, like myself included, when we're in these learned institutions. Okay, everyone. Uh, I think... I have to say thanks to Paul for taking time out of his busy schedule according to the notes. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a, maybe another slide, is that right? But there was a slide, that was on, on at the beginning. We're, 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 be, we're trying to be, I'm finally trying to, I'm trying to realise that you can actually like, make some money from this shit. Um, <laughs> and uh, we've, we've got some merchandise that you, with, with the Get Happier, with the GH of Get Happier, which is really cool. Which is really cool. You can buy, and we've, and we've got a website where you can just we we can just order by by order. So you get baseball caps, hoodies, t-shirts. You can all join the Get Happier movement, folks. I just say I do want to sincerely thank you. That was a really stimulating uh, Q and A. Hopefully, it gave you a sense of the type of thing that Paul is trying to do with these podcasts. So you can find the podcast anywhere that you find podcasts. I'm going to say something incredibly boring to end with, but there's an evaluation form that. Uh, <laughs> If you could fill out, or if you don't, but if you can fill it oh, out and hand I, it in Can the I way say back. one other piece of public... Sorry, because I'm so shit at this self-publication stuff. I've created a Substack, um, which I'm going to post stuff for free, but you don't want the free stuff, you want the paid-for stuff. Um, so get yourself subscribed to Substack. Thank and you. And just one final round of applause to yourselves for just a fantastic <laughs> question. Thank you. And to you, yes. That's what we have to say. <laughs>